Good morning. Welcome to Sunday Morning Worship with Grace Chapel. My name is Courtney Schultz. I serve as one of the pastors here alongside Alex Williams. And we are so grateful that you have chosen to spend part of your Sunday morning in worship of our God with us at Grace Chapel. Here at Grace Chapel, we want to create good with God, to ask questions about God, and use our voices to share our stories. And so we hope that you will join us in that endeavor. If you're with us for the first time this morning, we want to say a special welcome to you. And we hope that you will take a moment and fill out a connect card. That's the first way that we ask you to use your voice in the Grace Chapel community. You'll find that linked in the comments or on the homepage of our website, grace380.org. And our website is also where you'll find all the information about what's going on in the life of the church uh, week to week. When you fill out a connect card, you give us a little bit of your information so we can get to know you better, get to know some of your story, and share with you a little bit more about Grace Chapel's story and what we're doing in our community here on the 380 corridor. If you've been with us for a few weeks and haven't yet filled out a connect card, we'd invite you to do that as well. I also want everybody this morning to take a moment and say hi in the comments section. This is sort of like the lobby of worship in the virtual community. And so we can't know that you are a part of the community this morning unless you make yourself known. And so the best way to do that is to say hello. If you see somebody worshiping online with you this morning that you know, tell them hi, give them a virtual high five. But let us know that we are gathered together with many um, across time and space this morning bound together by the Holy Spirit. Good morning, friends. Welcome to the final Sunday of Advent. We are here in the week of Christmas, as hard as that is to believe, and it is a joy to be in worship with you here today. I want to take a quick moment to thank you for those of you who have participated in our stewardship campaign. We received a lot of cards, and we've, um, we've hit the goal that we were striving for, which was really incredible, and we are still hoping and asking that any of you who haven't had a chance to turn in a stewardship card to participate in the ministries of the church financially next year, to go ahead and do that. You can follow the link. God has been so faithful through all of you as you have responded during this time and said that we believe that God's work will continue no matter what. And we've been so blessed and grateful by that incredible generosity. So thank you for making our church sustainable for this year and through next year. In the light of that, we always offer a special offering during Christmas and Easter during these times where we are celebrating generosity and charitable giving and just the spirit of Christmas that we offer an ability for anyone that wants to give over and above their normal giving during this time to contribute to our special Christmas offering. It allows us to do some extra things. It allows us to tend to some needs in the church to help better prepare us for next year. It's a wonderful way to do a little extra here at the end of the year. If you feel called and led to do that, you can follow the link. You just go through our giving page, and when you make an online contribution or when you send a check to the church, make sure you check the Christmas offering box or write that in the memo line of your check as we are all in this together. We've got some worship uh, new schedule over the next couple of weeks. It's going to be a little bit different because because of Christmas and New Year's and everything going on. So today will be regular. We've got our online service here today, and then we will be outdoor in our parking lot today at 11.15. This week, for Christmas Eve, which is this Thursday, we will have a virtual service that will be available all day long. We'll post it in the morning and continue to post it throughout the day, so you can watch that at whatever time fits your family's schedule. If that's good in the morning for you or in the evening, whatever you'd like to do, that virtual Christmas Eve service with some special music, Mariel's bringing in some special guests, um, it'll be wonderful. You'll be very blessed by this amazing online candlelight service. That'll be all day on Christmas Eve, and then we'll gather in our parking lot on Christmas Eve at 5.15 p.m. for a candlelight service where we'll get to sing Silent Night and join together outside. So bring a chair, bring a coat. Make Make sure that you are there to participate with us on Christmas Eve. It's going to be a wonderful blessing and a wonderful service. The following two weeks, we are going to have virtual services only. So next Sunday, the 27th, we will be online only. We won't have an outdoor service, so go ahead and spend that time at home with your family. Uh, we will uh, be blessed to hear from our bishop, Michael McKee. Um, he has recorded a sermon for a lot of churches to use, and we love to hear from our bishop from time to time. And so we're going to be blessed by a word from our bishop this coming Sunday, so Make sure you tune in next Sunday at 10 a.m., but don't come at 11. We will not have our outdoor service. And then again on the 3rd of January, we will have virtual only at 10 a.m. as we kick off into a new service, looking at how we move from holidays into making every day of our life holy. How do we embody that ritual of worship into our daily lives? We're going to kick off that service or that series on January 3rd, and that'll be virtual only. So this week, Christmas Eve, virtual all day on Thursday and 5.15 p.m., and then we will have 
uh, virtual only for the next two Sundays, December 27th and January 3rd. Friends, welcome to worship. Say hello in the comments here this morning, and let us continue to praise God through music this morning. Friends, it is the final Sunday of Advent, and as we have done each and every week, we have asked a family in our church to light our Advent candles. So if you have your candles at home, join as we light them as we are led this morning by the Hall family. Hi, we're the Halls. I'm Chris. I'm Tiffany. I'm Lindsay. Last week, we lit the candle of joy. We light it again to remind us that joy exists even in the midst of our struggles. We light it, as well as the candles of hope and love. On this fourth week of Advent, we also light the candle of peace. May we seek to be peacemakers in this world. 
Mary reminds us that Christ would lead us on a path to peace on earth as it is in heaven. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. And he has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. We light this candle to open our eyes to the world around us. May the light of this candle give us the wisdom to seek peace. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we joyfully await the coming of our Savior, who enlightens our hearts and dispels the darkness of ignorance and sin. Pour out your blessings upon us and these candles. May their light reflect the splendor of Christ, who is the Lord forever. Amen. Will you join me in a word of prayer this morning? Holy, gracious, and loving God, we come to you here today on the final Sunday of Advent, closing out this season of preparation and anticipation. God, we have been waiting and preparing, praying, studying your words, singing these songs together, knowing that we are all waiting for this event that will culminate at the end of this week. God, it feels crazy to finally be here near the end of 2020. This has been the most tumultuous year of most of our lives. And yet we know that when we turn the calendar to 2021, things won't magically go away and get better. But we do know that there's hope. There's hope in the form of a vaccine that is spreading around our country and our world right now. There is hope in settled, infrequent political conversation compared to just a few weeks ago. There's hope in the healing and restoration of families coming back together after a very divisive year, a year full of separation, a year full of loss and loneliness and death. God, may we be peacemakers. May we spread that hope that we celebrate in its fullness this week. God, we live in a chaotic time, but you were born into a time of chaos. You were born into a place that was not your home. You were born in the most unfortunate, chaotic of circumstances, reminding us that you are not afraid of chaos, that you have control in all things, that you are with us, comforting us on our worst and darkest days and celebrating with us on our brightest days. So God, here today in this final week of Advent, let us continue to prepare knowing that that hope will be realized, that that hope is real and that you are with us. God, we love you, and we trust you, and we need you. Open our hearts that we may hear with joy what you say to us here today, and we will listen, and we will follow. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. We are continuing our series this morning that we've been considering through Advent, a different kind of Christmas, recognizing that um, 2020 certainly brings for most, if not all of us, some differences to our holiday season. And in the midst of that, we've talked about how our God becoming incarnate and dwelling among us as one of us was certainly a different thing. We talked about how Jesus was a different kind of ruler, a different kind of savior, a different kind of God. And today, we will consider how the promise that we have in the Christ child indeed is a different kind of hope. I want to remind you this morning that our GPS is posted on our Facebook page every day. That's our guide for prayer and study. Has a scripture reading and a prayer tip that relates back to the previous week's sermon. And so we hope that you will make use of that as a tool for staying connected to God through scripture study and prayer during the week. And it's a devotional tool. It's great for families. So please, please, please make use of that um, as you are able I would like for us to pray as we prepare our hearts to hear from God's word this morning. Let us pray. Holy and almighty God, we give thanks for our scripture. We give thanks for your Holy Spirit's presence with us each and every time we read it. God, I pray that our hearts and our minds, our ears might be open to hear the message that you have crafted for each of us this morning. God, may these words be your words. This message is a demonstration of your spirit's power and nothing of my own. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. You know, last week I focused on Jesus' humanity. 
And so this week, I want to turn us to Jesus' divinity. Perhaps no other place in the New Testament do we get a more divine image of who Jesus is than the prologue to the Gospel of John. John is so invested in our understanding that Jesus is the one true God in the flesh that he ties his prologue tightly to the book of Genesis that opens our Bibles. While the author of this gospel goes on to show us that Jesus indeed was very human, in the prologue of the narrative, he points us to the cosmic Jesus. And so that's what I want to share some of with you this morning. This is the gospel of John, chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The darkness did not overcome it. We see the reflection of the language from Genesis in the beginning. The Gospel of John opens. We see images of creation and light and dark. All things came into being. He was the light of all people. And we learn that this Jesus who is coming into the world is the very one who created in Genesis. The word was God. Without him, not one thing came into being. In Genesis, we read, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And in John, we read, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The cosmic Jesus brings us a different kind of hope, a light shining in the darkness. It's a different kind of hope because the promise in Jesus isn't one of no darkness. The promise isn't one of a life free of pain or struggle. Rather, the hope The promise is in everlasting light, a light that continues to push back the darkness even as it tries to take over. It's the promise echoed by Paul in Romans 8, 28, which reads, God is at work for good in all things for those who love God and are called according to God's purposes. God doesn't sit back when bad things happen in our lives or in our world. God is actively working to bring light even in the darkest nights. And the scripture tells us not just that the darkness did not overcome it, but actually the force of the Greek words behind that is that the darkness could not overcome it. It would not. It could not. It cannot. The darkness did not overcome it. The light shines. You know, I believe in this hope, this different kind of hope that our God offers to us in part because I've seen it play out in history. In the mid-19th century, a woman named Lydia Sexton began preaching in the United Brethren of Christ church circles. This is one of the denominations that we can trace our own United Methodist history back to. And in fact, Lydia has relatives who have served right here in our North Texas Conference. This was a woman ordained by God to be in ministry, given a preaching gift. But that doesn't mean that the world didn't try to push her into the night to stop who she was and call who she was called to be. Lydia had a challenging early adulthood. She lost not only one, but two husbands to early and untimely deaths. She married a third time after her second loss and was able to live out the rest of her life with that husband. As they settled down, she began attending a local church and then eventually preaching there. 
And if you read her autobiography, she gives detailed accounts of how she became a traveling preacher and the ways that she was received from town to town and church to church. It is a wonderful expression of a person following God's call and continuing through pushing beyond when the world tried to get in the way. She will tell you that sometimes she was favorably received and others not so much. She was never paid very much and certainly not paid the same as her male counterparts. But she had this radical hope in Christ, this different kind of hope. She knew the God she served and the world simply could not put out that light. She truly is an inspiration to me personally. Her story has encouraged and inspired me. After spending much of her adulthood traveling as a preacher, she um, began serving as the first woman prison chaplain at age 70 at the Kansas State Prison. And even after her formal resignation from the post, she continued serving there, preaching, baptizing, serving communion, to a congregation that eventually numbered almost 100 imprisoned people. This is what this woman did at 70 years old. Tragedy early on in her life might have stopped Lydia. Adversity from those who believed she shouldn't be doing what what God had called her to do might have stopped Lydia. Age and the end of a ministry career might have stopped Lydia, but she had God's grace. She knew she had Emmanuel, God with us. She knew she was being empowered by the Holy Spirit to share that good news in the world. And so she believed in the hope offered in the cosmic Jesus. And try as it might in her life, the darkness did not overcome it. I believe in this different kind of hope, this hope that God will always shine light in the darkness, always work for good in this hope in the cosmic Jesus. I believe it because Jesus' work didn't end with his death. It continued in his resurrection. And in his resurrection, we don't just have God defeating death itself. This is not just about God reanimating a dead body. Instead, we have God taking the greatest acts of evil that humanity could commit abandonment, abuse, physical violence, and even murder, and impressing them into the service of love. God took what humanity meant to be a weapon and used it as an instrument for love. I believe in this hope, not only because Jesus forgave the men who were crucifying crucifying him, not only because he did that, but because he remained with us in his humanity, even into his death, And he also came back and told Mary Magdalene to go tell the disciples the good news. He also came back and told Peter on the beach, I forgive you, go feed my sheep. He came back and said, Thomas, put your hands right here on mine. Believe in the cosmic Jesus. He came back and he taught the ones on the road to Emmaus. And he told them all, and he tells us now through them and their stories, go into the world by the power of my spirit and tell people this good news, that my spirit goes with you, that my spirit is at work in the world, that indeed the darkness did not and cannot and will not overcome it. This past two weeks, two churches in our United Methodist Connection have experienced pain and struggle. The first was Asbury UMC in Washington, D.C., where during a march organized by the Proud Boys organization, some demonstrators turned to vandalism, removing the sign from Asbury's church lawn that read Black Lives Matter and burning it in the street. That banner also carried the church's name, This was an act of violence, and I cannot imagine the pain and fear that might come from seeing my church's name burned in the street, and I cannot imagine the pain and fear that might come as a person of color seeing the words, Black Lives Matter, burn in the street. And so as your pastor, I want you to hear me call this act exactly what it is, 
an act of evil fueled by racism. We stand with our siblings in the African American and black community in calling for an end to these kinds of acts. And we support the law enforcement officers who are investigating this crime and seeking to hold those responsible accountable for their actions. It's worth telling you that a similar incident occurred on the same day in the same area to the Metropolitan AME Church as well. Indeed, our brothers and sisters there at Asbury have seen pain and struggle. The second incident in our connection, which is unrelated to this one, but happened much closer to home, was that Anna UMC, just down the road from us, had their building burned to the ground. I don't have information about how the fire started, whether it was an accident or done intentionally, we don't know. There's an open investigation. But no matter how it began, it was tragic. Their building not only housed their church services and programs, but also a preschool, much like our own. It was a complete loss with less than two weeks to Christmas Eve. Both of these incidents brought pain and suffering. Both of them would seem on the surface as if darkness was winning. Hate and evil and despair were trying to take over. But we are a people with a different kind of hope. A hope that knows God is bigger than all of it. A hope that knows that God is with us and for us and moving us. A hope that knows that God will bring about the light. The pastor of Asbury UMC, Reverend Dr. Mills, said this in her public statement following the events of the week at her church. Asbury United Methodist Church abhors violence of any kind. We call upon all to join us in prayer for our community, church, and people who are responsible for this hateful behavior. We believe this is a wake-up call for all to be more vigilant and committed to anti-racism and building a beloved community. And we invite you to join us. Our congregation will continue to stand steadfast. We will not be moved. We press on in the name of the Lord. Anna UMC has seen an outpouring of support from the connection. With bills being paid by individuals and other churches and space being loaned for meetings and worship, donations being made to restock their preschool and much more, I encourage all of you to go onto Anna's UMC's Facebook page and read their thank you list. It is inspiring to see how the body of Christ is bringing tangible hope into that community. And so while banners and buildings were burning in the last couple of weeks, our God was not sleeping. Our God was not absent. Our God is bringing hope. These two congregations will gather and worship in just a few days on Christmas Eve. In the face of all this evil and despair, in the face of all of these events, I can think of no better way to push back the dark than to stand in the face of all of this and claim good news for all people. That a child is born this day. That the light of the world has come into the world and that light is life for all people. These congregations will claim this magnificent light that breaks through even the darkest night. They will claim this life for all people and they will claim for themselves that darkness will not, cannot, will not overcome it. The end of the Gospel of John, the author tells us that he wrote all these things so that we may believe. So that we may believe that the word became flesh and dwelled among us. So that we may believe that death and despair and evil never get the last word. So that we may believe that God is with us and for us. So that we may believe that the darkness will not overcome it. Lydia believed it. Mary and Peter and Thomas and Paul believed it. 
The people of Asbury UMC and Anna UMC believe it. I believe it. Do you believe it this morning? This Christmas will be a different kind of Christmas for most all of us. This Jesus that is going to come to us in this Christmas, well, that's a different kind of ruler, a different kind of savior, a different kind of God, bringing us a different kind of hope. In four days, this is who we welcome. This, this Christ child, this baby born, in four days, this is who we welcome. Because on that night, thousands of years ago, the darkness did not, will not, could not overcome it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Each and every week we have the opportunity to give back to our God just some of what we have as a way of practicing our spiritual discipline of giving our tithes and offerings. And so we invite you to be a part of doing that very thing this morning. There are a couple of ways that you can make an offering to God and to the ministries of the church. You can do that by um, going online. You can see the link now and giving through our online portal. You can also mail a check Um, to the church building if you prefer to give in that way. We um, pray that God might bless the gifts we are about to receive. God, we pray that they might be multiplied and that we might be faithful stewards of them. May we go into the world honoring and glorifying you, almighty God, now and forever. Amen.
friends, it's been wonderful to be with you on this fourth Sunday in Advent. Go into the week ready to welcome the Christ child on Christmas Eve, knowing that in that baby came into the world the one true God, the light and the darkness cannot and will not overcome it. Go in peace.